They're coming to get you, Barbara. Welcome to Deconstructing, where I take apart an iconic horror movie to find out what makes it tick. In this episode, we're going even more old school than usual and revisiting one of the most influential, legendary, and powerful horror movies ever made. I'm talking about the very first feature film directed by one of the genre's all-time masters, George A. Romero. Now, I know that a lot of fans respect this film as a landmark of horror cinema, but don't necessarily include it in their top 10 lists. That could be due to it being shot in black and white and released in 1968, or because it's been in the public domain longer than most of us have been alive. In a way, it's like the Beatles of horror movies. People acknowledge its role in horror history, but don't really revisit it that often. That's a shame, and hopefully I can convince those folks otherwise by pointing out just how amazing this modest little flick truly is. Hence the deconstructing treatment and all that goes with it. That means we'll be breaking it down into three categories. Origin, in which we'll chart the film's humble beginnings from early in Romero's film career. Legacy, wherein I'll follow the film's path through movie history and its influence on an entire subgenre of horror. And mystery, as I examine some of the ambiguous aspects of the film and how many of them were later explored by Romero himself, as well as the fans and filmmakers he inspired. So board up your doors and windows and gather around the screen as we deconstruct the original classic, Night of the Living Dead. The beginnings of this film go pretty far back, all the way to George Romero's first professional film work in Pittsburgh in the mid-60s, working for a local ad agency Latent Image, which specialized in television ads, industrial, and educational films. Most TV commercials were shot on film in that era, and Romero honed his filmmaking skills, shooting and editing ads for beer and laundry detergent. Thrill to the Calgon story at your nearby family washing machine. He even directed a groundbreaking segment for the beloved children's show, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, in which he filmed Fred Rogers' own tonsillectomy to show kids that a trip to the hospital is nothing to fear. It's kind of ironic, considering Romero would spend the rest of his career terrifying audiences around the world. Nevertheless, he reached a bit of a creative plateau, and his love of filmmaking prompted him to explore the possibility of making a feature film. To accomplish this goal, he formed the production company Image 10, along with nine of his friends. After reading Richard Matheson's classic post-apocalypse novel, I Am Legend, he hit on the solution. Without adapting the story directly, he conceived a similar concept about the end of the world, shifting the focus on a global catastrophe to a small group of confused strangers trying to survive as the nightmare literally knocks on their door in the form of reanimated human corpses with unique dietary requirements. Over half a century later, we may have lost sight of just how shocking and groundbreaking this concept was, but bear in mind, up till then, the movie's only representation of the living dead was voodoo-themed stories like White Zombie, or even sci-fi schlock like Plan 9 from Outer Space. Not only do Romero's undead crave human flesh, we're shown graphic close-ups of them dining on the corpses of several characters. That level of violence may seem mild today, but to 1968 audiences reeling from the real-world horrors of Vietnam shown on the evening news, it was almost too much to bear. The film also broke new ground in independent filmmaking as Romero and his team collaborated at every level to reduce costs. Most of the actors did double or triple duty as crew members, and many also had dual roles as zombies. Night of the Living Dead proved to the world that talented creatives can make a successful feature film on a tiny budget, completely free of the Hollywood studio system. And with only a few exceptions, Romero stuck to that model through his entire career, seldom straying outside Pittsburgh and often working with the same team on both sides of the camera. This is without a doubt the most significant aspect of Romero's masterpiece, its tremendous impact on the horror genre in general and on zombie movies in particular. At first, Night of the Living Dead was mainly relegated to drive-ins across the US where it enjoyed a modest success. By the way, none of its ticket revenue made its way into the pockets of Romero, Image 10, or their investors, thanks to an oversight by the filmmakers who failed to copyright the title, thus allowing the distributor to exploit a legal loophole and pocket the profits. And Night of the Living Dead was relegated to the public domain. Romero tried to move on to other films across different genres with little to no financial success, and it wouldn't be until the mid-70s that Romero would finally reap the benefits of his first feature. 
Although Night of the Living Dead had long faded from the public consciousness in the United States, the film was a smash hit in other countries. In European markets throughout the 70s, audiences were screaming for more movies about flesh-eating undead ghouls, and studios couldn't make enough zombie flicks to satisfy their cravings. Enter Italian horror auteur Dario Argento. Argento reached out to Romero himself with an intriguing offer. If Romero wrote a sequel to Night of the Living Dead, Argento would secure overseas money to help finance the film, with the stipulation that he could recut and distribute the film for European audiences. The fruit of this perfect partnership was, of course, another landmark in horror cinema, Dawn of the Dead. Thankfully, the rising tide of zombie mania lifted Romero's boat enough to bring him back into the public consciousness. While he continued to expand on his Living Dead cinematic universe, Romero's success among horror audiences boosted him into the mainstream while he continued to embrace the independent filmmaking ideal. Volumes of analysis have been spent inserting this film into the socio-political turmoil of the late 1960s. From the aforementioned horrors of the Vietnam War, to clashes between the status quo and the civil rights movement, which further exposed issues of racism and class divisions in the U.S., but there's still ongoing debate over whether the film's themes were a deliberate reflection of those turbulent times. Romero himself claims he steered clear of political allegory in Night of the Living Dead, instead stating lead actor Dwayne Jones was not chosen for the color of his skin, but for his acting talent alone. That talent is unmistakable, as Jones is one of the genre's most powerful and memorable leads, but I think it would be naive to assume Romero ignored the significance of casting Jones as the hero. It's hard to see these roving bands of gun-toting rural white men without picturing the lynch mobs of the Jim Crow South especially in the finale, in which Ben emerges as the sole survivor of the farmhouse siege, only to be shot dead on sight by the hunters who fail to recognize his humanity. I think Romero knew exactly what he was doing, but chose not to point this out overtly. Okay, he's dead. Let's go get him. That's another one for the farm. In later interviews, he admitted to changing the script after casting Dwayne Jones. For example, in an earlier draft, Ben is depicted as a surly truck driver with a short temper, and Jones expressed concern that this could inflame racial tensions in a country still reeling from the assassination of Martin Luther King. Although most fans zero in on a few lines of dialogue from TV and radio broadcasts about the possible link between the zombie outbreak and radiation coming off a space probe returning from Venus, this theory is never proven. Romero himself says the origin of the ghouls is not important, and leaving it ambiguous underscores the resulting chaos and confusion. Romero continues this ambiguity in Dawn of the Dead, where scientists consider the outbreak to be the result of a viral infection, but again, it's never clarified. As with many drive-in movies of the time, Night of the Living Dead underwent a title change. In this case, the working title, Night of Anubis, named after the Egyptian god of death and rebirth, was dropped as being too intellectual for the drive-in crowd. It was subsequently retitled Night of the Flesh Eaters, but the distributor feared that was too similar to a horror exploitation flick from 1964 and changed it on the opening title card. That change caused the copyright fiasco I mentioned earlier. I could go on for hours about all the details, theories, and other nuances of Night of the Living Dead, but we'd rather hear your ideas about it. Do you have any pet theories, favorite bits of trivia, or personal stories about your first encounter with Night of the Living Dead? Be sure to share them in the comments. And while you're here, why not give this video a like and ring that little bell to subscribe for more original Joe Blow horror content. Lately, I've been missing legendary filmmaker George Romero, and I'm sure you feel the same. A while back, we deconstructed his original 1968 classic, Night of the Living Dead, which shocked audiences worldwide, sparked critical outrage, and ultimately changed the face of horror cinema. Well, today I'd like to take a crack at the sequel, which hit theaters a decade later and sparked its own firestorm of controversy before going on to become the most beloved film in Romero's catalog. As with so many of the classics we've covered in this series, there's very little that hasn't already been said about this landmark in horror history. But honestly, if I don't take a closer look at it, I'll have to turn in my horror fan card, so there you have it. 
As with all our deconstructing subjects, I'm taking a three-part approach, beginning with Origin, where we go back to Romero's first inspiration for the film. In Legacy, we'll take a look at its impact on the horror genre in general, and zombie movies in particular. And with Mystery, I'll dig even deeper to turn up some behind-the-scenes stories and rare bits of trivia about one of the most influential horror movies of all time, George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> If you need a little refresher on Night of the Living Dead and the origins of Romero's cinematic universe, we've got you covered with a dedicated episode. But if you're ready to dive into the history of its brilliant sequel, it's time to go shopping at Pennsylvania's historic Monroeville Mall. Built in 1969, Monroeville was once considered state-of-the-art when it came to indoor shopping centers, which were kind of a new thing back then, and it drew curious patrons from all over the state and beyond. Big time shopping is finally here, Monroeville Mall. Well, it just so happens the mall's general manager, Mark Mason, had mutual friends with Romero, and Mark gave him the grand tour of the brand new facility. Not just the stores, but the inner workings of the building, which was practically a self-contained city, offering just about anything consumers could dream of. One-stop shopping, anything you need, right at your fingertips. That planted the seed of an idea that would ultimately become the sequel to Romero's 1968 classic. Instead of seeking shelter in a rural farmhouse, what would city dwellers do in the event of a zombie outbreak? While Romero got to work drafting the script, news of the project made it all the way to Italy, where legendary director Dario Argento, a big fan of Night of the Living Dead, offered to help raise financing for the production in exchange for the right to recut and sell it to the international market. Argento also introduced him to the music of Goblin, who had gained worldwide acclaim for their score for Profondo Rosso and later Suspiria. Mark Mason not only granted Romero and his crew access to Monroeville Mall for shooting, Mason's company even helped with additional financing. Casting came next, and unlike the loosely defined characters in Night of the Living Dead, Romero sought out actors who personified his vision of the main protagonists. David Emge as pilot Stephen Andrews, Galen Ross as TV producer Francine Parker, Ken Foray as Peter Washington, a SWAT team leader with the best survival skills, who deserts the force along with fellow cop Roger DeMarco, played by Scott Reiniger, who becomes the loose cannon of the group. We whipped them and we got it all! Now, when I said Romero's crew had total access, there were still limits. They had to shoot when the mall was closed and only between the hours of 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. After 7, the crew and equipment had to be cleared out. That probably would have worked except for one big problem. Cameras started rolling in mid-November of 1977 just as the mall was putting up decorations for the holiday season. They found a way around that, but that meant shooting at the film's other locations until January and returning to Monroeville after the decorations came down. That turned out to be a blessing in disguise because it gave Romero the opportunity to edit the footage they'd already shot into a loose assembly so he would know exactly what additional shots to pick up as well as allowing some room to improvise and incorporate ideas from the crew. For example, makeup effects legend Tom Savini contributed a lot of those ideas, coming up with more comic touches for his role as the biker Blades and plenty of elaborate stunts, many of which he performed himself. Of course, Savini and his makeup team were responsible for transforming legions of enthusiastic extras into zombies, from the hordes of background shufflers to hero zombies that got the most close-ups. Romero gave Savini plenty of freedom in creating more elaborate makeups, and the looser January shooting schedule allowed him to try out some seriously nasty effects. One of Romero's many talents was his ability to shoot a wide range of coverage, giving him plenty of freedom in the editing process, where the pace and structure of the story really took shape. You can get an inside view of this process by watching Argento's international cut, which includes many alternate takes, shortened or eliminated scenes to speed up the action, and in some cases used entire sequences Romero had left on the cutting room floor. There was so much spare footage that the film was recut several times before the final English language version hit theaters. Dawn of the Dead had its European premiere on September 1st of 1978, but didn't reach U.S. screens until the following April. There was no doubt the MPAA would slap an X rating on that version, but Romero and producer Richard Rubenstein refused to recut it, which meant it went out unrated. That meant no one under 17 was admitted, and advertising was extremely limited compared to mainstream releases. But trailers and TV spots helped to get the word out, people lined up around the block to see it, and that was just the beginning. In U.S. theaters, Dawn was already in profit by the end of its opening weekend, and its initial run would add up to $16 million. It also caught fire internationally, racking up millions in Italy, Japan, and other territories. Not bad for an indie flick that cost less than a million to make. To this day, it remains the most profitable film in Romero's zombie series. 
Naturally, in the wake of Dawn's massive success, film markets around the world were falling all over themselves to crank out their own Living Dead epics. The majority of these came from Italy, where studios often produced quick and cheap knockoffs of successful Hollywood properties. Among them, Lucio Fulci's Zombie Due is by far the most infamous. As you might expect, horror fans who missed Dawn's original theatrical run were stoked to see it any way they could. It picked up a lot of attention on the midnight movie circuit, but really came into the public eye when it was released on videotape. The initial US video release from Thorn EMI hit video stores in late 1983, and soon could be found in virtually every video store in North America. Alternate cuts of the film were released in different territories, leading fans to seek out VHS copies of the Argento cut, and even an unfinished version that screened at the Cannes Film Festival, which some mistakenly labeled the director's cut. In reality, the theatrical version is Romero's preferred cut. I'd just like to know who everybody is. Yeah, me too. With the dawn of DVD, the three best-known edits of the film reached even wider audiences, and eventually made their way onto a box set from Anchor Bay called The Ultimate Edition. It's out of print, but not too hard to find yet. UK distributor Second Sight did an excellent remaster of the three main cuts, with documentaries and bonus content as a seven-disc set on Blu-ray and 4K HD. But American fans are still waiting for a similar stateside release. Despite the popularity of the first three Dead movies, Romero still couldn't get a major studio to finance a big-budget entry in the franchise. That is, until Zack Snyder's 2004 remake scored big at the box office. Suddenly, the studios began to take notice, and Universal proposed a big-budget adaptation of Romero's dream project, Dead Reckoning. But due to studio tampering and censorship, what was later titled Land of the Dead failed to recapture the magic, and Romero parted ways with Hollywood again. Still, after returning to his low-budget indie roots for two more Dead sequels, Romero couldn't manage to recapture the same lightning that Dawn did in the late 70s and early 80s, the closest Romero got to a truly epic sequel was the manuscript for The Living Dead, a novel he began before his death, which was eventually completed by horror author Daniel Krauss and released in 2020 to critical acclaim and strong sales. The book may be the ultimate zombie epic that Romero always wanted to make, but it's hard to say if the studios are ready to adapt it into a feature film or a limited TV series. Time will tell, I guess. early stages, the script was given the working title, Dawn of the Living Dead, to bring it in line with the first film's title. But Romero eventually dropped the word living from the title when he realized Dawn of the Dead had a more ominous feel to it. If you've seen Day of the Dead, I'm sure you remember the movie's main villain, Captain Rhodes, who meets a grisly and satisfying end. <laughs> Rhodes is played by the late Joe Pilato, but that wasn't his only role in Romero's zombie universe. In a scene cut from the theatrical edition, he plays a completely different character, a rogue cop who almost disrupts Stephen and Fran's escape plan. Steve Andrews. That's me. I'm Steve Andrews. Yeah, no shit. You already know Romero appears in the film's title sequence as the director of the chaotic emergency newscast, alongside his then fiancé, Christine Forrest. But did you know he appears on camera two other times? He has a blink-and-you'll-miss-it cameo as a zombified mall Santa Claus. He also can be seen firing this pistol at one of our fleeing heroes. Always with an eye on the budget, Romero cast the real-life Pagan's Motorcycle Club, who supplied their own hogs. They sometimes got a little too rowdy in the mall and ended up damaging some sections of the floor, but talk about realism. He also got soldiers from Pennsylvania's National Guard to play themselves on camera, and they even brought their own gear. This is probably one of the most notorious anecdotes about Dawn of the Dead. In the original script, Peter and Fran never make a daring escape in the helicopter. Instead, Peter shoots himself dead as the zombies surround him, and Fran decapitates herself by jumping into the chopper's blades. The most contested part of this original ending was whether or not Romero actually shot those scenes. Some actors and crew insist they were present during the filming of Fran's death, while Romero himself insists he never shot the scene. Over four decades later, the debate continues, but the happier ending remains. The Galen Ross dummy did find its way into another scene, this time made up to look like a man who gets his head blown up real good during the police raid on Housing Project 106. What if I told you that Romero's original trilogy, which ended in 1985, somehow pulled off one of the rarest feats 
ending on such a high note, Costanza himself would look down from the clouds and smile. The summer of George! Day the Dead is Romero's best entry, hands down. Zombies are firmly in the forefront of the mainstream public consciousness. And in doing so, they have lost their edge. It's a simple oversaturation in the market. Yet when done right, they can still show off some of that original Romero magic. And zombies have always been instrumental in representing these fears. Romero was responsible for creating the modern zombie and setting the rules that we still live by today. And what George A. Romero started in 1969 hit its high water mark in 1985. Night of the Living Dead is a classic black and white flick with a little gore and plenty to say about its chaotic times. Dawn perfected this by using color, growing the zombie herd and upping the gore. Of course, Savini was the secret ingredient here. Use the shopping mall setting to explore the dead's behavior, mankind's selfishness. These were and still are both amazing films, which set up the last chapter and its magnum opus, Day of the Dead. When boiled down, Dawn of the Dead has hope, but not day. No, no, hope belongs in Sewataneo, sending a boat. Sewataneo. Day takes place far enough into the zombie apocalypse that society has basically crumbled and the human race is nearing extinction. This bleak tone is not only a natural progression from the initial outbreak, but the culmination of the previous two films. Now, most of the story takes place in an underground missile silo with a small group of scientists and military personnel who have been tasked with finding a remedy to the outbreak. They are led by the hero scientist, Sarah Bowman, played by Lori Cardiel and the military captain, Henry Rhodes, played by the great Joseph Pilato, who just happens to steal this whole f***ing movie. I'm running this monkey farm now, Frankenstein, and I want to know what the fuck you're doing with my time! We start at the turning point in the survivor community. The former commander has died, with Rhodes moving up in rank. He has streamlined this into a power grab. Anybody else have any questions about the way things are going to run around here from now on? What little democracy that may have survived is now as dead as this. There's never a moment in this group where we feel a common goal, and that any sense of community has long since died. We are witnessing the last gasp, the crumbling foundation of a human society, the embers of a dying fire. And in one of the first meetings, Captain Rhodes threatens death if she doesn't obey an order and sit down. Sit down or so help me God, I'll have you shot. <laughs> you see this? This is what I would consider the lighthearted part of the film. Threatening death for a very blasé refusal of an order. Day of the Dead is all about the collapse, the cynical last breath of civilization. Now you may be tricked into thinking there is a better way forward, but Day's strength is crushing one's optimism with a harsh, cruel reality. When we enter this world, supplies and food are diminished. Yet, Dr. Frankenstein, the mad but brilliant scientist played by Richard Liberty, is actually making progress, or so it seems. He's focusing on zombie behavior over causation. Now, with a cure being unlikely, he starts to develop ways that they may be domesticated. Now, if you can't beat them, control. Domestication is represented by Bub. Bub. That's what the club fellows used to call my father. We get to learn more about the dead's familiar behavior, which was touched upon in Dawn. And it's here we get the sense that there is a, a little bit of humanity left within the living dead. Now, a concept like this is a tricky thing to do, yet is handled with respect and nuance by Bub's actor, Sherman Howard. Or because people are going to bitch in the comments, he is credited as Howard Sherman. Bub could have come off more clumsy or forced, but walks the line and never comes across as goofy. You grow to feel for him. There's a warmth and sensitivity to this puppy-like zombie. Now, you see, this is where Land of the Dead failed. Bub is how you kind of handle intelligent zombies in a way that doesn't seem laughable. But let's go to Land of the Dead and Big Daddy vocally communicating with the herd. <laughs> this level of intelligence can never work. It's like having a trained raptor, and I f***ing hated that. It just diminishes any threat of the monster and makes it a joke. What the fuck is this? But either way, back to day. This progress means little to nothing as Dr. Frankenstein is killed for using the dead military personnel as zombie treats for Bub. And here's the thing, I do buy that Frankenstein is so far removed from reality that he wouldn't think of using a dictator's comrades as food as a bad idea. What are you giving him in there, Frankenstein? And when it comes to Rhodes, he's a perfect grade-A asshole that brings a lot of passion and charm, man. The 80s had the best villains, and it's their lack of humanity and, and over-the-top embodiment that I miss so much these days. 
I mean, man, everyone is a anti-hero now. I'm just so bored. This is a fucking war! There's always been a critique about Day having no likable characters, but that's just not true. Is it deeply cynical and nihilistic? Sure, yeah. But that's what makes his characters more interesting than the previous entries. It's just that everyone is miserable and stressed here. We are witnessing end times. Yeah, yeah, we don't have a fun shopping montage, but it's not needed. Time has progressed and things are a lot worse off now. They're still likable, they're just not hopeful. The only people remotely calm here are the Jamaican helicopter pilot and the Irish Mr. Bean. And all the shopping malls are closed. Seriously, this drunk dude is Mr. Bean. And my only complaint is we didn't get enough of him. Every dead film mirrors its time, and this is no different. Day is deeply suspicious of the amount of unchecked power the military has, and of the military-industrial complex as a whole. Yet it's intertwined into an engaging story. Day of the Dead asks the question, if the structures of society crumbled, would the military be on our side? Or would they crown themselves king? Day of the Dead shows that Rhodes and his crew are deeply suspicious of science. What could come as a savior to everyone would mean giving up their leverage, their power. And anybody fucks with my command, they get court-martialed. This is a world where the human spirit is faded, where sexual aggression and hints of rape are constantly on the table where brute force is not only threatened, but seen as a reasonable method in communication. Do as I say, or die, is the new law of the land. Do we come together, or are we permanently driven apart? Are the monsters outside truly worse than the ones within? Now these questions are as old as time, story threads that have been used for generations. And Romero wisely uses them as set dressing for his nihilistic zombie tale. When it comes to selling the zombies, Day hits its peak. With a slightly higher budget, Tom Savini and Greg Nicotero come together to give us what we've always wanted. They realize the zombie to what we've all come to know and love. And here's the thing, I'll be honest, I've personally never cared for the look of the zombies from Dawn of the Dead. And here's the thing, I get it, the budget was smaller and this was the beginning of the outbreak. And of course it doesn't take away my enjoyment of an excellent sequel, but the painted green and blue faces never derived any fear or shock. And they've always looked like extras with stage paint. Again, I get it, there's no need to complain, I'm just saying that Day gave us a look that we still use today. We get more decay, battle wounds, and overall wear and tear. A perfect match for a perfect film. And my defense of Day of the Dead is not punching down on the first two, no. Night and Dawn have transcended horror and made George Romero a legend. There's a reason why his creation is a template for all. Those films have earned their rightful spot in cinema history, and deservedly so. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. Between the stoic and tough performance by Laurie Cardeal and a character that has actual obstacles overcome. A charming helicopter pilot played by Terry Alexander that somehow lets uh, almost nothing bother him. Uh, cheers, buddy. To Joseph Pilato kicking ass and taking names. Those are my men in there! Here's the thing, I actually saw him at Flashback Weekend during a screening of Day of the Dead and he was drinking and talking shit to the other characters on screen. It was amazing. It was basically my own special commentary right next to me. I'm gonna tell you this, this man is a f***ing champ and an overall great guy. But Day works because it's all about the loss and not the triumph over it. From its cynical point of view to the darker nature of humanity, Romero saved his most honest and brutal view of the human race for his ending chapter. It's one's lack of empathy and lack of communication that puts the final punctuation on the end of the world. Romero directed the original Night of the Living Dead from a screenplay he wrote with John A. Russo. When it came time for the remake, Romero handled the writing duties himself. He stuck to the concept of seven people seeking shelter in an isolated farmhouse as the unburied dead return to life. The characters are even the same. They interact with each other in the same ways, for the most part. Some of them even meet the same fate in 1990 as they met in 1968. Romero did tweak the dialogue and add the occasional twist. He also scripted the remake to be faster and more eventful, but he decided not to direct the movie. Online trivia claims that Capricorn One and Outland director Peter Hyams was offered to take the chance to take the helm, but that didn't work out because Hyams opted to make the Gene Hackman thriller Narrow Margin instead. It's difficult to find a source for this claim, so it may or may not have happened. 
What definitely happened is that Romero asked legendary special effects artist Tom Savini to direct. Romero and Savini had a working relationship that went back nearly 15 years at that point. Savini had been providing the bloodshed and taking acting roles in Romero's films since Martin in 1976. Romero had also given Savini the chance to get into directing, having him direct three episodes of his anthology series, Tales from the Dark Side. Based on the strength of those episodes, Romero knew his longtime collaborator could handle Night of the Living Dead 1990. Romero and Savini had first met when Savini was still in high school. This was in the mid-60s when Romero was thinking of making a movie called Wine of the Fawn. It would have been a coming-of-age movie set in the middle of ages, centering on a couple of teenagers. The teenage Savini was interested in being involved with the movie. When that project was scrapped and eventually replaced by Night of the Living Dead, Savini wanted to do the special effects, but he got sent off to the Vietnam War before filming began. When the new Night of the Living Dead was brought up to him, it was like getting a second chance to work on the movie he missed out on. Savini had some ideas for the new movie that got shot down very quickly, and since the first night had been in black and white, he thought the remake should start that way, with color gradually seeping in. The producers weren't into that. The remake is in color from the first frame. He also pitched the idea of zombie point of view shots that would be in black and white going in and out of focus. Romero didn't like that, feeling that seeing the world through the eyes of the zombies would give the dead too much life. One major change that Savini was able to bring to the table was the evolution of the Barbara character. In the original film, Barbara, played by Judith Odea, had been shocked into a catatonic stake early on and never really emerged from it. Savini wanted her to start off as an unstable, mousy schoolmom type, someone who needs her brother to drive her 200 miles to the cemetery her mother is buried in. She can't handle the drive on her own, but as the world falls apart around her, Barbara finds her inner strength and becomes a badass heroine. His vision for Barbara even drew comparisons to Sigourney Weaver in Aliens. Romero went along with it, a chance to make up for how weak Barbara had been the first time around. Caroline Williams, who had worked with Savini on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, was considered for Barbara, but the role went to Patricia Tallman, an actress and stuntwoman who had known Savini and Romero for a long time. She even had roles in Knight Riders and one of Savini's Dark Side episodes. A very strong character in the original film had been Ben, played by Dwayne Jones. It was going to be tough for anyone to try to live up to Jones's performance. Ving Rhames, Lawrence Fishburne, and Eric LaSalle were up for the role. Romero's then-wife Christine, an associate producer on the project, was particularly impressed by LaSalle's addition. But then, future genre icon Tony Todd, still a few years away from playing Candyman, came in and blew Savini away with his addition. He got the part. Aside from Barbara, who'd be looking quite different with short red hair, Savini wanted the cast to resemble the originals as much as possible. Given his association with horror, you might think he cast Tom Tolles in the film because he was familiar with him from Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer. But Savini hadn't seen Henry. He cast Tolles as the hard-headed, hot-tempered Harry Cooper, Ben's nemesis, because he could act and look like Carl Hardman from the first movie. McKee Anderson was cast as Harry's long-suffering wife, Helen, originally played by Marilyn Eastman. The Coopers have a young daughter who's suffering from a zombie bite. This character named Karen, played by Kyra Schoen, in 68 is now Sarah, played by Heather Mazur. Stepping in for Keith Wayne and Judith Ridley as young lovers Tom and Judy were William Butler and Kate Finneran. This was Finneran's screen debut. Genre fans already knew Butler from things like Ghoulies 2, Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, Freddy's Nightmares, and Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. That's right, the guy shared the screen with Ghoulies, Jason, Freddy, Leatherface, and Romero Zombies. Now that's a career we're proud of. Of course, it was also necessary to cast someone special in the role of Johnny, Barbara's short-lived brother who speaks the famous line, They're coming, coming to get, to get you, you, Barbara. Barbara. For this role, Savini chose Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2's Bill Mosley. The original Johnny had been played by Night of the Living Dead producer Russ Striner, who returned to produce the remake alongside Romero and original co-writer John A. Russo. Night of the Living Dead 1990, or Night 90, as it's called by fans and the people who were behind it, exists because of an error a distributor made 22 years earlier. 
The original film had landed a distribution deal with Continental Releasing, a division of the Walter Reed organization, but when they handed the film over, it was called Night of the Flesh Eaters. The decision was made to change the title to Night of the Living Dead, and when the distributor changed the title, they forgot to put a copyright notice on the film. Without that, Night of the Living Dead became public domain as soon as Continental sent it out into the world. The movie racked up millions of dollars that didn't go to Romero, his collaborators, or the rest of the investors. The Nightmakers filed a lawsuit against Continental that dragged on for years. As soon as the $3 million judgment was made in the filmmakers' favor, Continental went bankrupt, so that $3 million went out the window. They did get the rights to their movie back, but the bootlegging was so prolific they still didn't make much profit from it. They tried their best to take unauthorized copies and merchandise off the market, but it proved difficult to keep control of the stuff. Around 1986, another lawsuit had to be filed when Hal Roach Studios made a colorized version of the film without permission. Once that issue was dealt with, Russo decided it was time to face another problem. The possibility that someone might try to remake Night of the Living Dead. When he heard that a company in Texas was considering doing just that, he called Romero to get the ball rolling on their own remake. Romero openly admitted to Fangoria that the decision to make Night 90 was purely financial. They wanted to make money for the original investors who had been screwed over by the copyright ordeal. In the decades since Night 90 was released, we have seen unauthorized remakes being released along with other attempts to cash in on the familiar name without involving the original filmmakers. But at the end of the 80s, Romero Russo and their associates were able to get their remake into production before anyone else could. Almost everyone who had a hand in Night 68 was invited back to be part of Night 90, but there was one notable absence. Bill Heinzman had played the cemetery ghoul, the first zombie we see in the original film. He was one of the original Night investors, and you might expect to see him at least make a cameo in the remake. That didn't happen because he and others had just had a falling out. While they were trying to get the remake off the ground, Heinzman had decided to make his own low-budget zombie movie. He basically played the cemetery ghoul again in that film, which is best known by the title Flesh Eater. Romero and Russo had sent cease and desist letters to Heinzman telling him not to make it. He made it anyway, so he's not in Night 90. But thankfully, the old friends did bury the hatchet eventually. And Flesh Eater is really entertaining too. While the original Night was made for just over $100,000, Night 90 had a budget of $4 million. Menahem Golan's production company, 21st Century Film Corporation, got involved. A distribution deal was made with Columbia Pictures, a company that had passed on the chance to release the original because they didn't like the downbeat ending. That makes it sound like things should have been great on Night 90. Production should have gone smoothly. It should have been a blast to work on. And yet Savini has called the experience of directing the film the worst nightmare of his life. The trouble started well before filming. Savini had storyboards drawn of every single shot he wanted to capture on film. Romero was impressed. Then he pointed out that Savini had more shots planned than he'd be able to pull off during the 36-day shooting schedule. So the director already had to start whittling down his version of the storyboard stage. Like the previous Dead movies, Night 90 was shot in Pennsylvania. But once filming began, Romero was only on set for a few days. He was writing the Stephen King adaptation, The Dark Half, and had to get back to his home in Florida. He was facing a deadline and needed to focus on his script. Once Romero left, everything went to hell as far as Savini was concerned. He did not get along with the two producers who were left in charge. He never named names, but has said he didn't have any issues with Romero, his wife, Russo, or Striner. So you can try to figure out who gave him grief from there. These producers were constantly rushing Savini. They told him there wasn't enough time for some of the interesting shots he had planned. He wasn't given any time to shoot the moments necessary for suspense building scenes. He even claimed that one of the producers would call Romero and lie to him, telling him Savini was wasting time on set. During an interview with Film Monthly, Savini said in a quote, My hands were just slapped all over the place. I couldn't do a lot of stuff. This movie is about 40% of what I intended. It would be a much better movie if I had gotten to put in all the stuff I really wanted to do. 
One interesting scene that Savini had shot needed to be removed from the film in case of a lawsuit. The movie begins with Barbara and her brother Johnny visiting the cemetery where their mother is buried. Johnny is attacked and killed by a zombie there and Barbara runs off to the nearest farmhouse. Later, when zombies are attacking the farmhouse, Barbara was supposed to see a female ghoul that reminded her of her mother. The scene was filmed, Barbara imagining that an approaching zombie is her mom. Then the zombie gets shot in the head. Unfortunately, the person playing the mom lookalike zombie got a concussion from the blood squib on their head. The producers decided to take her out of the movie in case she ended up suing them for that injury. Her scene was replaced by the shirtless zombie who comes busting in. Barbara uses him as an example showing that he can't be killed unless he's shot in the head. Night 90 was cut down more at the behest of the MPAA. They seemed to have it out for Savini since he was known as the King of Splatter, and they probably weren't too happy that Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead had bypassed them and been released unrated. So they made sure to take as much blood out of Night 90 as they could. Night 90 earned its R rating and was given a theatrical release in October of 1990, but despite the well-known title and the Halloween season release, it wasn't a hit. The audience didn't seem very interested in watching the new version of Night of the Living Dead. The film made just under $6 million at the box office. Night 90 remains in the conversation because it was remake with Romero's involvement. It just was never as popular as the dead movies that came before it. It does have a solid fan following and some horror fans even enjoy it more than the original, but a lot less horror fans have seen it than have seen Night of the Living Dead 68. Made for financial reasons, Night 90 didn't make much money and didn't have much of an impact. Savini is disappointed with a lot of things about Night 90. He doesn't really like the music by Paul McCullough, a composer he didn't choose himself. He seems to feel that Night falls too late in the movie. One Blu-ray release tried to fix that for him by darkening the image. Fans didn't appreciate that very much. Savini's vision was compromised, and he even released a book of his storyboards to show fans what could have been. He did have some good ideas for moments that would have made the movie even better. But while the movie isn't what he imagined, it's still really good. Savini and cinematographer Frank Prinzi were able to capture an unsettling tone for the film. And while the director feels differently, McCullough's music goes well with the imagery. There's something very chilling about this movie. You truly feel like you're stuck in that farmhouse with the characters. On a dark, lonely night surrounded by the dead. And the farmhouse they filmed in was an incredible find the perfect location on an awesome looking piece of property. There's an intensity to Night 90 for most of the running time. It feels like the characters never get a chance to let their guard down for more than a second. In both this film and the original, the people in the farmhouse board up the doors and windows to keep the zombies out, or so they hope. The boarding process is done fairly early on in the 68 film and the boards are mostly secure. The characters are allowed to take a breather now and then, watch some television. That's not really the case in this one, and not just because the TV gets smashed, the boarding process continues throughout the majority of the film, the characters are constantly hammering things over doors and windows, and the zombies are always right there to complicate the process. Savini and Romero use the viewer's knowledge of the original to drop in misdirects. There are times when you think you know what's gonna happen because you saw the first movie, but then Savini hits you with a surprise. A big example of this comes during the first zombie attack. When Barbara and Johnny see a dazed looking old man approach them, you assume it's a zombie, the cemetery ghoul, but he's just an injured mourner. Barbara and Johnny are so focused on him that they don't see the actual cemetery ghoul until it's too late. The Barbara character is another curveball. At first, it looks like she's gonna be overwhelmed and follow the original Barbara into Catatonia, but she snaps out of it and she becomes stronger as the night goes on. Just like in the 68 movie, Ben and Harry Cooper have a serious disagreement over whether or not they should hide in the cellar. This time, Barbara presents another option. We should leave before it's too late. The zombies move so slowly, she feels they can just walk away from the farmhouse, take their guns and walk to safety. In this case, Barbara is right. Walking out of there is the best thing to do, but the others are too afraid of the zombies to take that risk. Tallman delivered a great performance as Barbara and the cast around her do strong work in their roles as well. Standouts are, of course, Todd and Tolls as Ben and Cooper. Those are the showiest parts. Their conflict gets a lot of attention and the actors made a meal of it. Their arguments get extremely heated and you can feel their violent anger emanating 
off the screen. Todd impressed Savini with his addition by memorizing lines quickly and getting emotional while reciting them. You can see his skill at this in the finished movie as well. One of the best scenes comes when Ben gives a monologue about his experience with the dead before reaching the farmhouse. As Todd speaks, tears are rolling down his face. It's captivating. But aside from all the emotional moments, there's plenty of zombie action to hold your attention and keep you entertained as well. It starts early with an exciting sequence set at the cemetery. That's quickly followed by more action when Barbara and Ben first reach the farmhouse. Bursts of horror come frequently throughout. As Savini said on his audio commentary, and I quote, people go to the movies to see things happen, not to watch people talk. He made sure there was always something happening in this movie. As he told the Los Angeles Times, he was aiming to make this a remake along the lines of The Thing and The Fly. He says, it's not better, but different. It's not a strict remake of the original. Same characters about the same plot, but it's more intense, a lot more intense. From increasing the amount of action to increasing the anger Ben and Cooper feel toward each other, he did successfully make an intense movie. Toward the end of the film, Romero's script also takes the story into territory he had entered with Dawn of the Dead and Day of the Dead. The idea that there's still a hint of humanity within the zombies and that people lose their humanity while dealing with the situation. We see people making a game of the zombie outbreak, hanging zombies, holding zombie fights, watching this happen around her. Barbara says, they're us. We're them and they're us. It's very reminiscent of the zombie movies Romero made between the two nights. The original Night of the Living Dead is a very important film in horror history. The remake, not so important, but it is absolutely worth watching. It's fun to see Romero and his collaborators return to the material after a couple of decades. The result is a movie that may not be an immortal classic, but is still one of the best entries in the zombie subgenre. Even with producer interference dragging him down, Savini proved to be a solid director. It's a shame there hasn't been a lot more Savini-directed movies since this one, but at least he made one that viewers will always be curious about and seek out due to the title. And unlike other remakes, sequels, and spin-offs that have come since, at least this Night of the Living Dead was done with the approval of the creators. Although I firmly believe remakes should be saved for great ideas that end up being subpar work, listen, I won't deny that every once in a while, someone turns in something great. Today, I'd like to look back at one of the early remakes of the 2000s remake boom to get it right. One that found a way to bring the original story into the more cynical mindset of 2004, while never looking down on the original material. Something that, you know, seems to happen more and more nowadays, but back then was quite rare. If there was one that was destined to fail, it was Dawn of the Dead, yet it didn't. Hell, it just about surprised all of us in 04. And though it doesn't surpass Romero's original, I mean, you know, culturally that's not impossible. What we got was a wild, gory, and intense ride that showed off the directing skills of a then music video director, Zack Snyder, and a mostly trauma writer by the name of James Gunn. So let's get into why Dawn of the Dead works in this scene that defines it. It's wild to look back at the remake boom, far removed from the anger and passion, to see a lot of, uh, well, let's be honest, safe, stale, middle-of-the-road entries. You know, it's almost cute how mad we got. <laughs> Man, who would have thought that the legacy sequel would end up being worse than these remakes? Time's a funny thing, huh? Picking up in the late 90s and peaking mid to late 2000s, we had some <laughs> And one of the biggest surprises was Dawn of the Dead. Also, oh, that we can sail off into the sunset on this asshole's boat? Yeah. Yeah. I'm in. Dawn 04 took the style of hyper-violence, fast editing, and artistic directing and filtered it through a 1970s story. And yes, credit must be given to 28 Days Later. And yes, again, I know they weren't actually traditional zombies, but people infected with the rage virus. But Dawn made it the trend that it eventually turned into. And Snyder's directing flares really made it pop. Not the slow burn meditation of the original, Dawn of 4 is a modern action movie aesthetic 
telling a horror tale. And so the defining scene is one that represents a style and tone. Now there are a few great scenes that could have been decent discussions, but to me, the opening is the pure batshit crazy energy that Dawn 04 adapted. It's a tad more cliched now, but this zero to 60 opening was something special to see in theaters. Dude, I was there opening weekend, crowd went nuts. We had claps, cheers, it was, it was something. It is the perfect tone setter. One that establishes the threat, the severity, and urgency. Sarah Polly plays Anna Clark, a nurse coming home after a long double. We get some dialogue about reports of a patient that may have turned for the worse. Another was wheeled quickly past with a neck wound. But of course, you know, it's just another day in the office for Anna. We set up a fake out with the ambulance driver asleep and the doors open. You know, it's a little tension build. It's starting early as the hammer is coming, but we're just not sure exactly when. Anna's doing her normal commute, and it's here Snyder gives us the overhead sprawling subdivision shot. Everyday America. Houses look the same, the same, for the sake of unity, never-ending streets, it's a maze. We are in the Midwest, folks. And she eventually makes it home to the hubby, played by Louis Ferreira. After some catching up and some shower sex, she heads in for the night to get some actual rest. Of course, during their water play, they both missed the emergency broadcast bulletin, setting up the beginning of humanity's end, and our main characters don't have a single clue. You know, I know it's quick, but it is surprisingly restrained for what becomes a roller coaster type of action horror movie. Calm, with a sense of dread, you know, eye of the storm type of thing. And then Vivian, a neighborhood kid, walks in full zombie and the adrenaline goes full blast. The reason this fast zombies work for the modern audience is it's pretty much hopeless. Yes, outside of plot armor, a full sprinting infectious carnivore that feels no pain is an apex predator. We are dead, no hope, no redemption, f***ing dead. The rose-colored glasses had worn thin, I suppose, and as a country, especially at that time, it's how we all felt. The thrill of Lewis being killed by a kid and Anna losing the love of her life to be immediately put in danger, barely escaping from Lewis in the bathroom. And let's talk about this great overhead stunt move that feels like it hurt. Now let's look at it again, especially the head. It's a stressful scene with Anna making it out the window just in time for the big reveal. The zombie outbreak is here. We take for granted a moment like this. I mean, hell, the whole scene, really. Since we've seen similar things in the following years, but the madness of complete chaos was something else. The neighbor willing to kill, and for an out of control ambulance to take him out was cool, man. <laughs> Snyder deserves credit, along with editor Niven Howie, for crafting such a dynamic escape. Anna finds safety in her car, and as she tries to exit the subdivision, we see her small suburb world burning. We are experiencing the onslaught of information as Anna does. I love this uh, locked on trunk shot as she tries to sort of exit. And if you've ever experienced the maze-like infrastructure of a subdivision, you get why this shot works. It's turn after turn after turn. To then go wide, you know, kind of similar to before. Now witnessing the destruction and its far reach. <laughs> the zoom into the gas station explosion is so over the top, I, I love it. Yeah, full on action here, folks. But here is the real sell. After everything, Anna crashes her car and gets knocked out. And we cut to the title card. Some bigwig at the CDC is going through the actual process of what would happen if all of this was real. Lack of concrete information and the final acknowledgement of complete ignorance. Cut to news flashes of the world ending. Scored to the tune of Johnny Cash, the man comes round. As the lyrics reference revelations, news clip after news clip, we see the end. This is one of the most perfectly toned setting openings. Cool, tense, and surprisingly poetic. There is something haunting about the line delivery of, we don't know. We don't know. Leading into the song. When the man comes around. 
God damn, that is how you open a movie. Dawn of the Dead turns 20 years old this year. This is a 20-year-old movie. Man, the sands of time are quick. The lessons of life silent. And if you don't slow down and take in the view, then the ride is nothing more than filler. Say, hey, don't worry, don't be afraid, ever, because this is just a ride. I aged two decades in hearing that this new movie is now factually old. But I've always had a blast with it. Zack Snyder was a great choice for a stylistic heavy movie. And while the remake may have not have been the sole factor, it absolutely played a role in shaping the direction of zombie films and influencing the evolution of the genre for a long time afterwards. If you haven't seen this in a while, it is still a blast. A tad goofy and over the top. But it fulfills the most important requirement for a movie of its type. It's a damn good time. Is it a virus? We don't know. How does it spread? Is it airborne? Airborne is a possibility. We don't know. Is this a health hazard or a military concern? Both. Are these people alive or dead? We don't know. Stop the avalanche of a human race. 